we can come and worship whether you're here in person or whether you're online. We're grateful that you've tuned in today. We're just going to worship him in spirit and in truth and give him all the praise and all the glory that's due his name. Can we do that this morning? Can somebody say amen?
Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Come on, let's sing it right here.
Thank you this morning that you are rich in mercy. We thank you this morning of your goodness. In scripture it says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, but it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one would boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Carry your victory 
story Perfection could never earn it You give me what we don't deserve it You take the broken things I love this right here And raise them to glory to be with us, Lord. You want us to be in your presence. You want us to be right there with you. In eternity one day, we'll just be standing there with you, worshiping you, giving you praise and adoration, Lord. 
God, I just pray right now, Lord, I pray that we would never get tired of worshiping you while we're here on earth. Because if we're tired of it now, I can't, when we get to heaven, we're going to be really bored. But Lord, today, I just pray that, that you are worshiped, that you are praised, that you are adored, that you are given all the honor and glory that is due your name. Lord God, you sent your son Jesus to this earth for the sole purpose of dying for our sins, that we might one day see you face to face in eternity. And Lord, that we would have that opportunity to just praise you and give you honor when we're in, in heaven with you. God, I pray today, Lord, you would help us to never, ever forget that. That, Lord, we should be walking in worship every single moment of our life. Our lives should just be a reflection of who you are, giving you praise in everything that we do and everything we say and every thought that we have. And Lord, though that may seem nearly impossible, Lord, I know that you can be glorified in our lives, Lord, simply because we've been washed in the blood of Jesus. And Lord, we're thankful for that today. And it's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Turn to two or three people and say, you sang pretty good today. Before we continue in our service, I have just a couple of announcements for you. If you miss any of the things I say, visit riversidechurch.org 411. Or if you're in our auditorium, scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you to download the Riverside app, or you can stop by Next Steps in the lobby. Ladies, listen up. Wednesdays are for women this summer, and we have the next installment in our summer series, a women's craft night. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're a super crafty person or not, we have instructors that will be here to show you step-by-step step how to create some really awesome crafts. Don't miss it. Sign up on the 411 page. That's all I have for you, Riverside. Have a great week. Good morning, Riverside Church. It's good to see you all here this morning. Um, yeah, please come to Craft Night, ladies. I am the least craftiest person in the world, so I think that you'll enjoy it. Um, some announcements for you today. I just wanted to welcome you, and whether you're here for the first time in person or online, we want you to feel connected and feel like Riverside uh, is getting to be your church home as soon as possible. So take out your phone if you want to. You can do that while we're talking right now, and you can uh, download the app. It's Riverside Southwest Florida. And visit the 411 page. You'll get all the information, as Peggy said, on all the announcements that we're doing today. If you're here for the first time in person, please stop at the first time guest uh, reception area and pick up a gift that we have for you. And if you're online, fill out a connect card because someone from our guest services team would love to connect with you this week. Um, we're going to be having Discover classes coming up soon. If you're new here or you've been here for a while but you want to get connected, this is a great place for you to do that. You can discover um, what's been designed. Discover has been designed to help you learn your purpose and your mission and your influence um, as we continue to try to make disciples that live and follow Jesus. So there are three sessions. It starts on Sunday, July 10th. It's after the second service, or I'm sorry, it's during the second service. And you can register for that on the 411 page. You guys probably noticed these postcards. It's not upside down. On your chair, take them home with you, put them on your refrigerator, put them on your dashboard, take them somewhere and remember where, you're, where you will look at them and you'll remember next week we're starting Sundays of summer and our staff has just come up with some fun ideas to make Sundays a little bit more exciting uh, in July. So the first one starts next week. We're going to be celebrating the 4th of July that week. So dress in your red, white, and blue and you can um, possibly maybe get a random prize, and we're just gonna enjoy that, but we're also gonna have popsicles on the patio. So come prepare for that next week, and there's gonna be a different theme every week, and the card mentions what those are. That's why you need to keep the cards, keep them handy. Um, so this is the part of our service where we're privileged to take an offering and give back a portion of what the Lord has given to us. There's various ways to do that. You can do it online. You can check out the 411 page and go from there. There's also drop boxes in the lobby on your way out. I just wanted to share with you that um, this church is such a generous and giving church, and I'm so thankful for that. Uh, coming up in July, on July 6th through 10th, I get the privilege of leading 
10 women, uh, myself included, to a new trip that we're partnering with Mission of Hope. We're going to Key West. The uh, trip is called Hope for Her. This is the first time they've done this in Key West. We're really excited about it. We get to go and be an encouragement and bring hope to the pastor's wives and their women's leaders and their women in their churches. So we'll get to spend time with them and bless them and just have great fellowship with them and, and just love on them a bit. And we're also going to get to go with them and serve in their communities. We're partnering with three churches there. We're really excited about that. And your generosity is paying for a portion of that trip, so thank you for that. And then also today at 1030, uh, we had a bus with um, fourth through sixth graders pull out to go to Word of Life Camp. They also have been blessed by your generosity because 15 students this year have been able to receive scholarships um, because of what you have given. So thank you for that. Thank you, Riverside. That's about all I have for you today. Um, I just wanted to pray for our campers, and I'm going to turn this over to the uh, guest speaker that we have. Um, we ha this is going to continue in our service and continuing in our series, um, ask questions that Jesus asked. So let me pray for our campers. Father, we are so thankful uh, to be here, to be part of this body, to be um, reveling in your generosity to us. We're thankful, Lord, for the way that you generously bless us and that we can turn around and uh, generously bless others. So, Lord, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for being in our midst today. Thank you for these students that are going up to camp. We pray, God, that you be with them, that you take them safely there, that they would have a wonderful time hearing your word and worshiping and having fun, and that this week would be a week where they grow a little bit more like Jesus, where they learn to love a little bit more like Jesus does and, and walk with him. So thank you, Lord, for that opportunity for them. Again, Lord, be with their leaders. Give them energy and strength and wisdom and discernment and bring them all home safely, um, just fired up for you. Lord, we love you and praise you and thank you for blessing us. So in Jesus' name, amen. special speaker. <laughs> we are delighted to have Eric Willis. Eric is from uh, Texas. He served with Steve uh, out in Bent Tree Church out there, and um, he even survived being Steve's boss. So uh, that was that's a pretty big feat to, uh, to take on, but we're glad that he's here today. Um, here's a cool thing about Eric and Steve's relationship. Um, uh, Steve and Eric went on a, a retreat back in 2009, and kind of Steve was kind of in this recalibration of what he was to do uh, in his future, and it was at that point he decided that he wanted to pursue being a senior pastor, and so uh, I think it was under Eric's uh, encouragement that, that he took that leap of faith and uh, stepped into senior ministry, so we're grateful for that, Eric, and, and you're a part of Steve's life and part of our lives uh, here at Riverside Church. Uh, I never like to say that uh, we have a guest speaker. I, I always like to say we have someone new in the family, um, because when you walk into Riverside Church, you're not a guest, you're part of our family. And so um, before, before we welcome Eric uh, into our Riverside family, I want to tell you a little bit about his family. Uh, he and his wife have raised their own basketball team, which is pretty amazing. Uh, they have five boys with great hearts and talents. And Eric currently leads a ministry to help and restore pastors, as well as help churches walk through conflict, and its ministry is called Reclaim Leadership. And so we're grateful that you have uh, stepped out and you're doing that ministry. I know in the last couple years, uh, since COVID and even during COVID, uh, there have been so many pastors that I know of that have either burned out or have left the ministry. And Eric's ministry that he is doing is so vital, uh, not only to uh, churches, but just the kingdom in general. Um, and so we're so grateful to have you, thankful for your ministry. Can we make Eric feel welcome this morning? Thank you, church. Good morning. 
Uh, it is still morning, right? Uh, hey, you guys have a great way of welcoming Texans. Your thunderstorms are awesome. So thanks for having me this morning. Uh, Riverside does feel like family. It's, it's amazing when I walked in this morning and just the interaction with the first service and not that you have to live up to some standard that the first service set for you, but you feel like family. And speaking of family, I'd love to show you a little bit of mine, but uh, in this sermon series that we're continuing, uh, the question that Jesus asks, uh, do you want to be well? It's a great question. And we're going to dive into that in just a minute. But I don't want to be a stranger. Since we're now family, let me share a little bit of mine with you. This is my wife, Jennifer. We've been married since 1991. That was a great year. I think it's been 30 one years or something like that. Uh, she is a NICU nurse, works with little babies in the hospital to help them at a criti critical stage in their development. Um, and we do have five boys. Uh, this picture is a couple of years old, but our youngest, Luke, uh, just graduated high school. Any empty nesters in the room? Right? So we are heading into that stage. And he's headed off to college this fall. Uh, we're excited for him. Uh, and then next to him is Gabriel. Uh, Gabe is at uh, Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. He's on a D1 scholarship in track and field. Uh, he's a high jumper. And uh, his PR is 6 feet 11 and 3 quarter inches. Wow. That's like taller than me. And so uh, Gabe is there. He's enjoying life. And then our middle son, Josiah, just graduated Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, got married and moved to Pennsylvania, wherever that is. I think it's up that direction. Um, and so he and his wife are in Pennsylvania. He's a youth pastor and a Bible teacher there. Uh, he's teaching, get this, he's teaching Greek. And um, what's that disc stuff? It's not disc golf, ultimate Frisbee. You can teach a class in that. I don't understand, but that's what he's doing. That's Josiah. And, and then Gay, or, uh, this is Micah uh, on this side here. He's our second born. Uh, the cool thing about Micah is he and his wife are both educators, and he is the music teacher at the elementary school that he actually attended when he was a little kid. So that's kind of a cool uh, story. And then our oldest son, Caleb, in the glasses there, um, Caleb and his wife, Kim, uh, they're uh, worship leaders. Uh, he is a worship pastor at Bent Tree, where we come from in, in Dallas, and uh, his wife, Kim, is also uh, uh, a vocal coach uh, at a local private Christian school. But Caleb and Kim uh, gave us this. <clears throat> so this is Judah. This is my grandson. And he's wearing a shirt that says, I love my pops. I'm pops. And so uh, Judah came along about eight months ago. And we are just loving being grandparents, our first grandchild. And uh, they live close enough where we can uh, take him and give him back uh, at the end of the day. It's kind of that fun. Uh, but here are the Willis women. Uh, of course, my wife Jennifer in the middle. And then Kim, the mom of Judah on this side. And Katie, who is Micah's wife, uh, who is a special ed teacher in elementary school. Uh, she's the other educator. And then here is Josiah and his wife Madison. Uh, and we are going to be uh, Pops again, Pops Squared, in uh, November. Uh, they're up in Pennsylvania. I'll have to find out where that is, and I'll have to go visit them. But that's, uh, that's my family. That's us. So thank you for welcoming me into your family here at Riverside. Um, as you can imagine, we have had decades of memories with five boys, um, not all of them have been rosy, okay? Uh, there have been some pretty bad moments. Uh, this is a picture of Luke on crutches during his physical therapy session after he broke his femur. Uh, which bone in your body is the most difficult to break? The femur, all right? Uh, he was uh, dropping back for a pass. He was a quarterback in the seventh grade football team, and he got blindsided by a 300-pound seventh grader, and his femur broke. Um, that was not a fun time, not a fun time. Another not-so-fun time was when Jennifer had a seizure 
out of the, out of the blue and, and fell and hit her head and just all kinds of scary moments of doctor's visits and trying to figure out what was going on with her. Um, that was a difficult season of memory. And then Micah, our second born, when he was a toddler, decided to give mom a birthday present. And so he was jumping on the bed doing flips, which is the awesome, most awesome birthday gift you could ever give your mom. Uh, and, but he fell off the bed and cracked his head open uh, on the computer table there. Uh, so we rushed into the, the bathroom, grabbed a towel, compressed the head wound uh, to keep the, the blood uh, in, uh, and rushed him to the emergency room. Note to self, when you grab a towel to compress a head wound and you run into the emergency room, make sure that the towel that you grabbed is not red, okay? The, the nursing staff just kind of freaked out when we walked in holding this. They thought he bled out. But uh, anyway, not every memory is great, is it? The most recent thing to happen is uh, this past March. Uh, March 25th, 8.30 a.m., I received a telephone call. Matter of fact, I call it my wake-up call. It was a call from my doctor giving me a report on some lab work that they had done. My uh, glucose, my blood glucose A1C number was over 10. If you know, you know. You see, I'm a type 2 diabetic, and on my 40th birthday, I went into the doctor for my annual physical, and he said, congratulations, you have diabetes, happy birthday to me, right? I didn't take it seriously. Didn't, you know, I took the pills, but my lifestyle didn't change. I didn't change my eating habits. I didn't exercise. And so for 12 years, I've just been um, lazy with my physical health. And then in March, I get a wake-up call. An A1C number over 10, the doctor continued on this telephone call to tell me that I'm going to start having uh, neuropathy, nerve pain in my feet, could lead to amputation, my kidneys will fail, I'll lose my sight. And the list kept going on and on. And I got angry. I got angry at me for not taking seriously what I needed to be about lifestyle change-wise with my diabetes. That was my wake-up call. I'm on this journey. And I would venture to say that everyone in this room is on some sort of journey with physical health. There have been some diagnoses that have hit your home and hit really close to where you live, maybe even yourself. As a matter of fact, in 2022, there will be an estimated 1.9 million new cancer cases diagnosed just this year. That number is astronomical. In 2020, there was a report done by the Center for Disease Control about diabetes. 10.5% of the U.S. population had either type 1, type 2, or type 1.5 diabetes. First of all, who knew there was a 1.5? But diabetes is rampant in our culture. So, here's the real kicker. 100% of us in this room that are breathing right now will not be at some point. The reality of life culminates in death. All right, y'all have a great day. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no, the see... I don't want to leave us hopeless. And before we go all gloom and doom and woe is us, I want to take us to God's word and see where Jesus asked a question of a man who received his wake-up call. So if you have your Bibles with you today, please open them to John chapter 5. John is one of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. Pretty easy to find. If you don't have your physical Bible with you today, your phone have great apps available for you to find God's Word available. Feel free to use that as well. And if you need to send a text or an email, please do. I don't care. But here's, here's the deal. This morning, the question that we're going to be looking at is a question that Jesus asked. Do you want to be well? Do you want to be well? John chapter 5, verse 1. After this... 
There was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. All right. After this is very similar to the word therefore, which uh, a, a couple of weeks ago I heard Pastor Steve, because I've been live streaming you guys for a little while, uh, remind you that whenever you see therefore in Scripture, we need to ask, what is it therefore? After this is very similar. Okay. Um, what was Jesus doing prior to this portion of the text we're diving into. It requires us to go back to chapter 4. And in chapter 4, we see Jesus walking. And he's starting his earthly ministry. Signs and wonders. There's uh, the changing of water to wine. There's this incredible conversation he has with a woman sitting at a well in Samaria, of all places. The Samaritans and the Jews, they did not get along. And Jesus engaged there. And many Samaritans came uh, to faith in Jesus and became disciples of Jesus because he talked about living water, not just the water that comes up from the well. And then in, he continues walking around the region and uh, uh, he heals an official's son without being physically present where that sick child was. It was a long distance healing. And it was based on faith. So what was Jesus doing? He was walking in this area. You see Galilee, up near the Sea of Galilee, Samaria, down in here, uh, following the Jordan River from the Sea of Galilee all the way down to the Dead Sea, uh, down near Jerusalem. And when they say Dead Sea, they mean it. I've been there. Uh, there's nothing alive there. It's just a bunch of salt uh, around. And what's fascinating is Jesus is heading down to Jerusalem for a feast. And this is a, a really cool thing scholars have figured out is that Jesus was starting his earthly ministry around A.D. 31. And the Feast of the Jews would be the Feast of Tabernacles. And in the year A.D. 31, it would have been October 27th to 28th. So if you want a date on when Jesus was walking around doing this, that's it. Now there is in Jerusalem, as Jesus made his way down into Jerusalem, after doing all of these things, beginning his earthly ministry, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. Really a, a square kind of thing. Two squares put together, five colonnades. And it's in this place that a multitude of invalids would lay. Blind, lame, paralyzed. The, the, the one word that captures it all is disabled. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. I'm looking around the room, and that's longer than some of you have been alive. He's been an invalid for 38 years. Now, let's put it in context. At this point in time in ancient history, the average male lived only 40 years. This man has spent his life disabled. 38 years. He was under one of these porticos, the colonnades. This is the pool of Bethesda, two pools separated by uh, a colonnade, five colonnades there, just outside the sheep gate, which was a small entrance into the temple. And what's fascinating is the sheep gate was used for a purpose. Those who were bringing sacrifices into the temple, they would wash their sheep in the water on their way into the temple. The higher ups in society wouldn't come to the pool of Bethesda. The higher chiefs, uh, Jewish rulers, would not soil themselves by going to the pool of Bethesda. But guess where Jesus went? He went to the pool of Bethesda. When Jesus saw this man lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? There's the wake-up call. Do you want to be healed? It's a pretty straightforward question. What do you think the responses could be to that question? There is a yes and there is a no thank you. As straightforward as this question is, do you want to be healed? 
There's a nuance in the original language. Jesus is not asking this man if he wants a quick fix for his physical health. That's not what this question is. Jesus is asking this man, do you want to be characterized, infused with well-being and being well? There's a difference between asking someone, do you want to get well or do you want to be well? Jesus is asking, do you want to be well? Do you want to take on the characteristics of being well? Do you want to be healed? Well, as straightforward as this question is, the man's response wasn't as straightforward. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water's stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. It's a sad testimony to a lack of support, a lack of friends, a lack of encouragement around you. This man's response was not a yes or a no to the question, do you want to be healed? It was an excuse as to why he can't get healed. You see, the superstition of the day was that there were angels from heaven that would come down and stir the water, and when the water is stirred, the first one in gets healed. This man had banked everything, put everything toward the hope that he could make it into the water. He was stuck in a mindset that said, if I could just get in the water, then I'll be healed. What mindset are we stuck in to say, if just this, then I'll be better or I'll be healed or I won't have this physical ailment? Something to consider. Jesus then said to him, And I don't believe Jesus was standing over him. I believe Jesus was sitting next to him. And Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Uh Uh-oh. Get up, take your bed, and walk. One of those is a miracle. The other is against the law. Get up. Take your bed was against Jewish law on Sabbath. You could not pick up your mat and move it. It was a man-made law. Get up and walk was a miracle on Sabbath. Think about what Sabbath is. Sabbath is a holy day set apart. What better day to receive healing? Get up and walk. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. Excuse me? It's not lawful for you to take up your bed and walk. But this man answered them, what are you talking about? No, he didn't say that. He said, "Uh, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. I have no idea who it was But when he sat down with compassion and authority and told me to take up my bed and walk, I did. So I will. Thank you very much. He didn't know who healed him. He just knew that he was healed. Jesus, you see his compassion. You see his authority. Take up your mat. Take up your bed and walk be healed. And the Jewish leaders of the day, get back on your mat. (laughs) Can you imagine? Well, try to. You've been healed. And you've been told to go back to a place. Imagine the angst that you would feel. But since a man did not know who healed him, Um, He didn't know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Have you all noticed in Scripture that Jesus has this uncanny ability to kind of disappear uh, on occasion? Um, To just kind of fade into the background, to fade into uh, the crowd? That's what he did here. I'm convinced that Jesus didn't disappear like some magical, mystical kind of thing. I don't think he did that. I think he intentionally moved from this healing into the temple through the sheep's gate. And so he left the room to go to the temple. 
Afterward, this is why I know that Jesus was there. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. The man who was healed, where did he go first thing after he was healed? He went to the temple. He went to worship God. Praise God, I'm healed. Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. All right, 98% of us are sitting here thinking, that's a difficult sentence. What in the world is Jesus talking about? Let me clarify for you that what you're reading here in this text is some of the most encouraging words you will ever hear. If you think about what you know and what we know about the physical healings and miracles that Jesus did, it often came with a phrase, go and sin no more. That's a difficult passage, difficult sentence to comprehend. Let me undifficult it for us. Jesus walks in, finds the guy in the temple, and he says, look at you. You're doing great. Jesus is encouraging this guy. My dear brother, sin has so many consequences. I want you to avoid that at all costs. May today be a turning point for you in your life. Can you imagine Jesus and his compassion giving encouragement to you in your time of need? just as he gave encouragement to this man who was healed. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Jesus is not telling this man that if you sin again, you're going to be disabled again. Jesus is reminding him that sin has eternal consequences, not just temporary consequences. I think I'm convinced <laughs> that we have the emphasis on the wrong syllable when it comes to physical healing. Should we pray for physical healing? Absolutely, yes. Do we know the one who can provide physical and emotional healing? Absolutely, yes. But I'm afraid that we as a society have put more emphasis on our physical healing than we have our spiritual well-being. Jesus is more concerned for our spiritual eternity than he is our temporary physical. Doesn't mean he doesn't care. He cares more for where we are spiritually in relationship to him, which is why he says, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. What's the worst thing that can happen to you? It's not getting physically sick and dying. The worst thing that can happen to you is getting physically sick, dying, and spending an eternity without Christ. Your spiritual well-being is of primary importance. Should you pray for physical and emotional and mental healing? Please do. Yes. Yes. But how is your spiritual well-being? So here's what I want you to take away today. Physical and emotional healing may happen, but spiritual healing must happen. Today I want you to be thinking through and uh, processing where you are in your spiritual well-being. Are you spending more time focused on maturing in your faith and growing spiritually if you have trusted Christ? Or have you come to that place of actually putting your trust in Christ? Tend to your spiritual well-being today. Pray for your physical healing. Pray for others' physical healing. Carry one another's burdens. All of these are biblical and appropriate but I want you to do so in context of your spiritual well-being first because Jesus was concerned about that. So let's go back to our man who was healed. The man went away after this interaction with Jesus in the temple and he found the Jewish leaders and he 
told the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him. It was Jesus. It was this guy, Jesus. I don't think Jesus walked up to him and said, my name's Jesus and I just healed you. I think there were whisperings around in the room, in the temple. That's Jesus. I heard he did a miracle and healed an official's son. Well, I heard he turned water into wine in Cana. I heard he came about salvation and all this stuff. I'm still wrapping my head around it. He claims to be the Messiah. And so there's all this talk. I think the man heard and was told who it was that healed him. And then he, in turn, because he has a story to tell, 38 years of being disabled, he's now walking. And he tells the Jews, it was Jesus who healed me. I'm convinced that the healed man told the Jews out of his exuberance of being able to walk, not knowing the plots that they would have to accuse Jesus of breaking the law and pursuing Jesus for blasphemy, claiming to be God. And we all know how that turned out. But this was the early days of his ministry. So, here's your wake-up call. Do you want to be well? And when you answer that question, do you want to be well, are you filtering it through the physical ailments that you have? Are you filtering that through the emotional hurts that you have endured, the mental struggles that you engage on a daily basis? Those are appropriate, but they're supplementary. They are secondary to your spiritual well-being. Do you want to be well? Jesus is more concerned for your spiritual well-being, your spiritual health. We're all on a journey. We're all on a journey. I like to tell people to, to two literal places, heaven or hell. And what determines your forever destination is not how physically fit you are. It's not how good of a person you are. It's not how bad of a person you are that determines your forever destination. There's only one thing that determines your forever destination, and that is what will you do with Jesus? Do you believe that he was God's one and only son, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, and willingly went to the cross and he died, shedding his blood to cover your sin. What will you do with Jesus? Your spiritual well-being begins when you answer that question. I have diabetes, like some of you in this room. Some of you have diagnoses that are far more dire, but just as traumatic. We should be praying for physical healing. We should be praying for one another for physical healing. But when we do, pray for spiritual well-being. Because Jesus told us, Go and sin no more after you've been healed. He's more concerned about our spiritual well-being. So that's a challenge for us. My question is, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Christ alone for your salvation, for your spiritual well-being? And if the answer is I don't know or I think so or no, then today is the day that you get to claim it as truth in your life. We're going to pray, and as I pray, there are no special words or magic incantation type thing that you need to pray to accept Christ. You just need to allow your heart to express itself to the Lord. What do you desire? Do you desire a relationship with Jesus? Let him know as we pray. Father God, we do come to you acknowledging 
that you alone are worthy of our worship and praise. We acknowledge that you also, God, have within your power to heal us physically, emotionally, mentally. And we acknowledge, Heavenly Father, that we are available for you to provide your healing as only you can, and we would give you all the praise and all the glory for that healing. We also realize, Heavenly Father, that you love us so deeply that you care even more for our spiritual relationship with you. God, I pray that our hearts will be healed, spiritually secure in the knowledge and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. If you prayed asking God to place your spiritual well-being in place and to trust him, I'm going to ask you to do something. Tell somebody. You have a story to tell. Tell somebody. Well, church, may this week be the week that you pray for physical healing, not only for yourselves, but also for those loved ones and people around you but also pray for their spiritual healing and spiritual well-being. It's of primary importance for the other side of this temporary life. God bless you. Thank you.